Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Valerie Jordan, and I am a member of the North Carolina Board of Transportation, and I represent this county and the counties in Division 5. It is a great to see in each and every one of you, and again, welcome as we dedicate the portion of Interstate 85 from Colmill Road to US 70 bypass to the John Hope Franklin Highway. This is truly a very special occasion. Dr. Franklin made such significant impact for North Carolina and the people that live in it. And because of that, this is the reason why you're here today and the amount of folks that's joining us today. We are honored to have Governor Roy Cooper here today. Mayor Bill Bell. <laughs> Former U.S. Secretary Fox is here with us today. And we also have many, many distinguished speakers in attendance. Now, with that being said, we also have some of our elected officials here this morning from various cities, towns, and counties. And I would like for each of those individuals to be, please stand and be um, recognized. <laughs> also, Dr. Franklin's family is also in attendance. So if everyone will please mind standing as we acknowledge those uh, guests as well. by the Durham Police Department Honor Guards, followed by the National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, that will be sung by the North Carolina Central University Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Are we ready for the presentation of the Black and the Colors? Sit. Permission has been granted, you may be seated. Good afternoon, everybody. We are North Carolina Central University's Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Today we will be performing our rendition of the National Anthem and the Black National Anthem with their voice music. We ask that you please stand for <laughs>
the North Carolina University Vocal Jazz Ensemble for being a part of today's ceremony. At this time, I would like to ask Reverend Mark Anthony Middleton, the pastor of the Abundant Life Hope Christian Church in Durham, to please come forward and give the invitation. The Durham community recognizes the rich variety and depth of our faith tradition here in our city, those with faith and those of no faith. So we offer this prayer in recognition of that richness of our culture here in Durham. Let us pray. God of Moses, the lawgiver, God of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God of all creation, we ask that you would be pleased with what we do here today, that your spirit of justice, of love and inclusion might animate this day. We thank you for the powerful, powerful act of remembering and for the sacred act of naming. And as we gather today to name a section of our highway after our son, our brother, our leader, the eminent John Hope Franklin, May our naming remind us of the importance of each of our names and each of our stories. Come now, lighten this room with your presence, that we may go out and lighten the world. It is in your name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. It is with great honor that I introduce our first speaker former United States Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox. Mr. Fox served as the United States Secretary of Transportation from 2013 to 2017. Previously, he served as the Mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina from 2009 to 2013. He was first elected to the City Council in 2005. Upon his 2009 mayor victory, he became the youngest mayor of Charlotte and is the second African-American mayor. Mr. Fox is also the one who requested the designation for today of the Dr. John H. Franklin Highway. And I can say without a doubt, the community here thanks you, sir, and everyone who requested this dedication. Mr. Fox, if you would please join me. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce the mayor. I'm sorry. The, uh, <laughs> Secretary Anthony Fox, he's going to give our remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here today. I was actually not supposed to be here today. And I want to thank the planners for making room for uh, a spontaneous uh, show up, we call it, uh, in, in politics. But I had to be here today. Um, uh, this has been a team effort, um, and I can tell you that from the governor of North Carolina, my good friend, Roy Cooper, who enthusiastically embraced this idea of when I called him about it in the waning days of the Obama administration, to Congressman Butterfield, to Mayor Bell, to the city council here at Durham, everyone has played a role in this, in this naming. But I want to give you just a little bit of uh, context for why it occurred uh, to me. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood that was bifurcated by freeways. And as I learned about the history of our interstate system, I understood that while it is one of the most robust economic development tools we have in our country, it's also something that divided and in some cases eliminated neighborhoods and as we looked at the history of it, more than two-thirds of the communities that were decimated by the highway's construction were poor and minority communities. And yet, when you go down our freeways across this country, very few African-American names appear on those freeways. And when we think about John Hope Franklin, uh, someone who really carved out African-American history as a discipline, and who helped us understand the significance of African American history in the greater context of our American society. Uh, there could be no better person to highlight and to hold up as an example, not just of someone who was a great intellectual, 
a great leader, but someone who had something incredibly important to say to us about the future. And at this time, when we see examples of Charlottesville and examples of Ferguson and Baltimore and even Charlotte, it's a time for us to begin to reflect on the fact that whether you live in rural North Carolina or urban North Carolina, whether you're white or black, rich, poor, Native American, Asian, Latino, we are all here together and we're not going anywhere. So, um, so it's with great heart that I sit here and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. But I just would like to also add that as we commemorate today, we need to support groups like ASALA, uh, a group that John Hope Franklin started. It is now looking to increase the number of monuments and dedications to African Americans. We also need to think about women on our highways who are underrepresented. Um, so let this be the beginning of a new effort to recognize all of North Carolina on our byways and highways. Thank you. stop some of these tax cuts that are going to be enacted by the Congress of the United States. And about eight or ten other things that are very critical over the next few weeks. But thank you, Valerie Jordan, for your leadership. Thank you for the great work that you do for the Department of Transportation. Uh, to my 30-plus year friend, Governor Roy Cooper, thank you for your leadership, sir. Uh, you should know that Governor Cooper has assembled probably the most diverse team in North Carolina history. And I'm honored. We thank you, sir, for your service and thank you for coming today. Uh, to the mayor, I guess soon to be former mayor of the city of Durham, Mayor Bill Bell, and to the other state, county, and city officials, uh, to Secretary Fox, thank you for your work, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor uh, to have a very small part uh, in this program today not just to honor a great African-American, but to honor a great American, a man who did so much, so much for our great country. I, I cannot say that I had a personal friendship or relationship with uh, Dr. John Hope Franklin. That was my loss. I did sit with him on an airplane one day between Raleigh, Durham and Washington National Airport. And it seemed like the flight lasted for five minutes uh, because he talked the entire way and, and we sat together and he told me about the indignities that he experienced in Oklahoma uh, when he was growing up years ago. Uh, he told me, Secretary Fox, about how he and his mother were ejected from a train uh, when, when he was growing up as a child and when he moved to Tulsa, how that same incident repeated itself again. And so we've come today to, to honor a great American, and it's my joy to have a part in the program. One thing about Dr. John Hope Franklin is that he knew what lane to stay in. He knew his strengths, and I presume that he knew his weaknesses. He knew that his strength was intellectual. Uh, his strength was education. His strength was, was imparting knowledge to people who are uninformed. And so he spent his lifetime imparting knowledge to America. And so on behalf of the 700,000 plus citizens of the 1st Congressional District, we want to thank Secretary Fox for his extraordinary leadership in getting this started. And Secretary Fox and I were on speed dial when he was Secretary of DOT. We didn't tell a lot of people that, uh, but we talked often. And I remember him telling me that one day that one of his last achievements that he wanted to accomplish was to get this done. And he has made it happen. The governor of North Carolina embraced it. His Department of Transportation embraced it. And here we are today. So thank you, all of you who have had a role to play in this event. 
But more recently, I came to understand that he was personally hired by Dr. James E. Shepard, the founder of that great institution. And after building an unmatched scholarly and academic reputation in this country and abroad, Dr. John Hope Franklin returned to Durham in 1983, specifically to Duke University, where he was appointed the James B. Duke Professor of History. And as we know during that time, he wrote, he lectured, and led important projects and initiatives in areas including race, racial reconciliation, ethics, democracy, and more. I had the great pleasure of getting to know John Hope Franklin through my membership in Sigma Pi Phi, a national fraternity that has leadership, education, and civic responsibility as a part of its core mission. I was honored to regularly hear his reflections on the important milestones of his career. And this man, who walked with kings, was so down to earth. Literally, he was as comfortable on the national stage as he was in his greenhouse, tending his beloved orchid collection. We all remember how much he loved orchids. Truly, John Hope was a Renaissance man, in my opinion. As I close, let me offer my thanks to the Department of Transportation and the board and other officials for making today possible and for helping to keep the name and legacy of Dr. John Hope Franklin in the fabric of Durham for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. The next speaker I would like to invite to the stage is Senator Floyd B. McKissick, Jr. He's the Senior Deputy Director Leader of the North Carolina General Assembly. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, good to be here on this podium with so many distinguished guests today. Governor Cooper, thank you for all that you do for our state. Secretary Fox, thank you for initiating this concept and bestowing this unique privilege and honor because it's one that's so well earned and deserved. And thank you, Mayor Bell, for all of the decades of service that you have given to Durham. I know next Monday night you'll no longer be our mayor officially, but uh, for all of us who know the leadership that you have provided as a member of the county commissioners and as our mayor, Going back now to, my gosh, about 2002, I just want to thank you. For all of you. For all of you that are here today, thank you for coming out. Because this is an important and significant occasion. It could occur at no more fitting and appropriate place than this very venue. This was the heartbeat and the center of the civil rights movement. If you lived through the 50s, if you lived through the 60s, you know St. Joseph was the place where all the civil rights leaders came. This podium was where they stood. This podium is where they spoke. And it is from this church that people loaded up in buses to go out and desegregate public facilities in this community. So no more fitting place could this particular ceremony occur. When I think back at John Hope Franklin, I think back when I first met him through my dad. I mean, my dad was very active, as many of you know, in the civil rights movement, but he started a center called the North Carolina Center for the Study of Black History. John Hope Franklin was a member of that board of directors. I served on that board, and one of the things that we actually worked on was an archive of the records of people from here in North Carolina. And that archive was actually kept in the annex of this very building, down at the lower level for about seven or eight years until many of those records, including my dad's records, were transferred over to UNC Chapel Hill. It was that very commitment to preserving and understanding black history that John Hope Franklin was about. I can remember meeting with him on many occasions, probably about once a quarter, right over here in this very building, in that annex. We worked on programs dealing with preparing the next generation for leadership, mentoring programs that brought students in to North Carolina Central University's campus in the summer months and exposed those kids for about three weeks to all that they needed to know 
to understand when it came to politics, to bringing in a whole cadre of leaders to expose them to what they could become, but more importantly, opening up their minds to opportunities that otherwise they would never have. That's what County Hope Franklin was about. That's part of that legacy that many people don't may not know about. But it's part of the legacy that is very much a part of what he was involved in. I think back to the times when I met with him outside of those meetings right here at St. Joseph, but over in the home of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Darrell Lamont Roberts. So you might remember Dr. Roberts. He's a professor over at, at Duke University for quite some time before he went on to Tuskegee, where he headed up the political science department. But had it not been, had it not been for Jonathan Franklin, Dr. Roberts would never come to Durham. If it had not been for John Hope Franklin's, Skipper Gates would have never come to Durham and worked over at Duke before going on to Harvard. He brought that quality of talent to our community, that type of inspired leadership. If I think back to those times of sitting in Dr. Roberts' home and the knowledge that you could just gain from sitting there talking for hours with those three of them, it was enormous. But Dr. Franklin was somebody who was fitting and appropriate for the time. He was intelligent, he was persuasive, he was direct, but most importantly, you know where he stood at the end of the conversation. But he could use that gentleness of persuasion, that gentleness of influence, to make a remarkable and impressionable point, whatever it may happen to be. Somebody that opened up doors. He was so good and so crafted at that skill set that President Clinton appointed him to take charge of a commission that dealt with dealing with racial, racial reconciliation in America. And if there's ever a time where we needed to bring Dr. Franklin back today to deal with racial reconciliation, it is now. <laughs> it is right now. We could really use that skill set with what's going on in our country and the divisiveness that has reemerged within the last year or so, because it's now okay to do so, because it gets the blessings to the very top within our country. Dr. Franklin, wherever you may be today, if you could just enlighten the souls, the hearts, the imagination of those of us that are here, to inspire us to carry on your legacy, but more importantly, to build upon those values that were intrinsic within you, to help us to carry on that mission that you started, you blazed the pathway. You charted the course. We only need to follow. Thank you for all you did. This honor and recognition of this highway is fitting. It's appropriate. It's well overdue. But more importantly, hopefully when people pass along the byways and they see that name, and they may not know it, maybe they'll go back and study it. Maybe they'll understand his contributions. But more importantly, maybe each and every one of us can help continue that legacy in whatever small way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Now I would like to invite Dr. Everett D. Ward. He's the General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and he is also the President of St. Augustine's University. Dr. Ward. Good evening. Of course, to our governor, Governor Cooper, and to Mayor Bell, and to Secretary Fox, and all assembled on the dais, good afternoon, and to the audience, good afternoon. On behalf of St. Augustine's University, it is indeed an honor to be here with you today as we commemorate the legacy of a great mentor and friend, Dr. John Hope Franklin. Dr. Franklin served St. Augustine's with a notable distinction as a professor of history nearly 70 years ago. During that critical period in American history, Dr. Franklin motivated his students and his colleagues to excel beyond traditional limitations. After learning of his doctoral requirements and the subsequent awarding of the PhD degree from Harvard University, Dr. Franklin was advised by then St. Augustine's University President Edgar Gould to guard his professional actions towards colleagues that had limited educational attainment. However, very fortunately for all of us, 
Dr. Franklin was driven internally by his own words. Dr. Franklin once stated, and I quote, if the house is to be set in order, one cannot begin with the present. He must begin with the past. Dr. Franklin dedicated his life to beginning with the past to ensure that American history reflected the enormous contributions of African American citizens. Today, as the 11th president of St. Augustine's University, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the founding of St. Augustine's University, I know firsthand as a former student of St. Augustine's, the benefit of Dr. Franklin's intellectual resolve. One of my most cherished treasures is my fifth edition, John, of From Slavery to Freedom, A History of Negro Americans. I use this as a student at St. Augustine's University. And here we are 70 years later, after the first publication dated September the 22nd, 1947. St. Augustine's University students are today using the book From Slavery to Freedom. That deserves a round of applause. And I was in a, a history class just two weeks ago talking with students and a professor. It was John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom book that they were using. His resolve and his determination is what we celebrate today. And I can say without a doubt, his publication, The Free Negro of North Carolina, has a direct benefit to me because it was in that publication that he recognized my great-great-grandfather. So for this president, John Hope Franklin was a mentor and indeed a great brother. And as his has already been said, his genuine commitment to a new generation. And as the 35th General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, I can tell you the countless days that we would be together at conventions, and he would always find time to mentor the young Alphas as we prepared our way. And I close with the true story of John Hope Franklin. At one of our general conventions, we honored John Hope. And he brought his books, and we were there to sign books. He signed autograph books for us. And I had my first edition of From Slavery to Freedom, 1947, that my great uncle passed on to me, John. And your father said, can I buy that book from you? <laughs> and I said, Dr. Franklin, I love you as a brother, but you cannot have my book. So today we honor this great man and let us be committed for years to come. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard J. Powell, the Dean of the Humanities and John Spencer Bassett, Professor of Art and Art History at Duke University. Dr. Powell. Thank you. The social significance and symbolism of the highway for African Americans did not evade Professor John Hope Franklin's scholarly purview. From his pioneering research on the extreme chances enslaved women and men took as they embarked down southern US roadways to escape slavery and liberate themselves, <coughs> to his careful documentation of the pivotal role highway transportation played in the mid-20th century struggle African Americans experienced for public accommodations. Professor John Hope Franklin was keenly aware of the, Af of, of the American highway as a site of contestation and liberatory possibilities for black Americans. For Professor Franklin, the road was not a, a hallucinatory Jack Kerouac beat generation metaphor for freedom. It was the African American's conduit to a new life, to reestablish bonds of affection, 
to economic prosperity, and to finding a way out of no way. And yet, Professor Franklin would, would have also appreciated the poetics of roads, freeways, and interstate routes, especially in the narratives and musical expressions of black folk. While teaching at St. Augustine's College from 1939 to 1943, and from 1943 to 1947 teaching at North Carolina Central University, Professor Franklin would have traversed the roads and highways between Raleigh, Durham, and Goldsboro, the latter his wife, Aurelia Whittington Franklin's hometown, where he would have witnessed firsthand the new and decrepit automobiles, the overloaded trucks, the Jim Crow buses, and the mule and horse and oxen-drawn wagons carrying people and produce throughout North Carolina's Piedmont region. Toiling away in the segregated section of the North Carolina State Archives in the late 1930s and early 1940s, Professor Franklin might have paused while conducting research for the free Negro in North Carolina to listen to one of the many itinerant blues musicians playing on Raleigh's street corners in those years. One of the frequently performed songs, Keys to the Highway, perfectly captured African-American feelings concerning the accessibility and openness that major roadways and thoroughfares offered. I got the key to the highway, built out and bound to go. I'm going to leave here running because walking is too much slow. When the mood creeps over the mountain, honey, I'll be on my way. I'm going to walk this highway until the break of day. Well, so long, so long, baby, I must say goodbye. I'm going to roam this highway until the day I die. Literally blocks away from Durham's tobacco warehouses and cotton mills, where these blues musicians also practiced their characteristic art form. Professor John Hope Franklin ensconced in his North Carolina Central um, University offices in the mid-1940s could not have avoided the harmonic strains of a Piedmont blues soundtrack while completing his canonical From Slavery to Freedom. Who could have imagined in 1947, the year Professor Franklin completed his African American Chronicle, that 70 years later we returned to the neighborhood of that book's genesis to celebrate the renaming of a section of Interstate 85 in his honor. On behalf of my Duke University colleagues, the students at Duke and North Carolina Central Universities, as well as the greater Research Triangle academic community, I applaud the state of North Carolina for recognizing, via this tribute, Professor John Hope Franklin's amazing, important contributions to our state, to our country, and to humanity at large. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Now I'd like to invite Gail Faulkner Hudson, who is the Executive Director of the Durham Literacy Center. I'm here for Lizzie Ellis Furlong, the Executive Director of the Durham Literacy Center. Uh, who was sick this morning, and she's even sicker that she can't be here because she really wanted to and was so inspired by Dr. Franklin. Um, I also want to thank Mayor Bell for allowing us for, as the Durham Literacy Center to be represented today because it's very important to us to honor Dr. Franklin because he so honored us. Um, I wear this tiny little orchid today, and I was so glad that you mentioned that, because he did, although he walked with giants and kings, he was a gentle giant, and as he grew his orchids, it took such a tender touch, which one time on the board, he compared that to literacy, that it takes a, a giant of knowledge and of patience to teach someone to be literate, but it also takes a tender touch to take that individual and love and care about that individual, and he indeed did that. On a personal level, um, I'm a North Carolinian and um, have been in Durham since I was a tiny little kid. And uh, my father 
was um, given, um, bestowed the Order of the Long Leaf Pine. And I had heard about it, but I didn't think too much about it. I just thought he was given that for his work in equal rights and civil rights. And um, then one day, when I found out that Dr. Franklin had been given the Order of the Long Leaf Pine, it suddenly became very, very important. And I thought about my father and how my father was honored to be in some way at the table with a giant like Dr. Franklin and how wonderful that they shared this honor. And in many ways, I hope today that although very different in race, one white, one black, I hope they're together somewhere and talking about what they had in common with their dream, their intent, and their spirit. Dr. Franklin was so good to the Durham Literacy Center. He believed in literacy. He served on our board until he passed. And he shared with us such support in, in his community thoughts, his involvement, and he made this speech. Um, it was a commencement speech at, speech at Duke, and it's so beautifully stated about a story in his life pertaining to literacy that I'd love to read it to you right now. Dr. Franklin said, one of the most rewarding experiences you can possibly have is to guide a child or an adult to learn to read and write. I had that experience when I was 20 years old. It was during my first year as a graduate student. One evening during my first month in Cambridge, a man twice my age rapped at my door softly and I invited him in. He said he needed help in making out a letter. He said that he couldn't read it because the handwriting was so poor and could I please read the letter to him? Well, when I took the letter to do that, I saw it was very well written, easily understandable, and I wondered who had been helping him to read. When I completed the task of reading the letter to my visitor, I suggested that it would be good if he and I could work together and brush up on his reading. He protested and he said, oh, you don't have the time to mess with me. I told him I would take the time if he would come to my room at five o'clock each night for the next eight months. Well, he did, and we worked together six days a week. And by the end of the term, I knew nothing about English. I, who knew nothing about teaching English, had transformed a person from literacy, from illiteracy, to one who could read and write simple sentences. Two days before I received my Master of Arts degree, my student, for the first time in his whole life, wrote a letter to his family in Virginia. During that week I graduated, I read a letter from this man, this older man, who had written a letter to me. It was this experience, more than any other, that inspired me to dedicate myself to the educational enterprise. This story is amazing, but it's not surprising. Dr. Franklin was such a remarkable man to take the time to teach, to work with this individual, and change this individual's life as he brought literacy into his life. We are so excited to think that a portion of our highway will represent Dr. Franklin and will remind those who travel there of our community and our society and how it has been touched by his grace, his kindness, and his concern. Here is one last quote he shared with us one night on the board, and this is what he said. I think that literacy is a fundamental characteristic of any society. If you are not literate, you cannot function effectively and successfully in, in our society or any society. Thank you so much for letting me share from the Durham Literacy Uh, before we move on to the next program, I do want to acknowledge one of our distinguished guests. If Dr. Atkin Lady would please stand, he is our Chancellor from North Carolina State University. Thank you, sir. So, with that being said, um, I would like to bring up our next keynote speaker. 
And to him, to me, he's um, I'm my governor. He's your governor. He's the governor of this great state of North Carolina. Would please stand, everyone, and give a round of applause for our governor of the great state of North Carolina. Thank you, Valerie, and all of you who have joined us today. Thank you to the family of Dr. Franklin, honoring us with your presence. Secretary Fox, thank you, and Valerie and the team at the Department of Transportation. Secretary Jim Trocken, we have uh, David Howard and Al Austin and Michael Fox. Thank you for doing this. And I'm grateful for this great Durham legislative delegation that you send to work with me in Raleigh, the dean of your delegation, Nikki Michaud, who is here, along with representatives uh, Marsha Morey and uh, uh, Representative Marianne Black, Senator McKissick, and Senator Mike Woodard. Thank you for what you do. And, and I want to thank you for inviting me to honor this man who has done so much to improve our state. And a man, a man who has really laid the groundwork for the mission that I have for our state. That mission is, at the end of my term as governor, I want a North Carolina where people are better educated, where they're healthier, where they have more money in their pockets, and they have the opportunities to live a more abundant and purposeful life. That's what I want. That's my mission state for our state. And I want to, before I say a few words about Dr. Franklin and this dedication, I do want to thank someone who has worked tirelessly for this city and our state, uh, the mayor for the last 16 years on the Board of County Commissioners. He's guided Durham to a remarkable period where it has become a center for education, medicine, technology, arts and culture, and more. I know it's been done before, but I want you to join me in thanking Mayor Bill Bell for his service to keep so many people gathered today for this highway dedication. There are some truly great leaders, not only on this stage, but out in the audience. And most all of them would tell you that in some way, Dr. John Hope Franklin has had an effect on their lives, whether through knowing him or through his writings. A lifetime dedicated to the betterment of others takes true passion, selflessness, and determination. It's really rare to come across an individual so willing to give up themselves over to that kind of service, and even more rare to have that kind of service performed by someone with such skill, talent, and great intellectual capacity. It's that kind of person that we honor today with this highway dedication, Dr. John Hope Franklin. I think as a result of the work of Dr. Franklin, the America that we live in today is a different place from the one into which he was born in 1915. Growing up in the Jim Crow South, Dr. Franklin saw firsthand and felt personally the horrors of racism. As a young child, he saw Tulsa, Oklahoma's black neighborhoods burn in the 1921 Tulsa riots, and he saw people killed. As he grew up and became a student of history, he saw how racism throughout history affects how we think and act today. Dr. Franklin spent his life showing us that we must not look away from these ugly truths, that we should remember them with unflinching honesty 
and confront them head on that we should learn from them. Dr. Franklin elevated the experiences of black Americans into the fabric of our American society. He worked tirelessly to turn them into real change, and he did. Now, Dr. Franklin knew the difference between history and advocacy. As a scholar, he kept them separate. But he also knew that the knowledge of history could be the catalyst for advocacy. In other words, he knew that education inspires change. In 1954, Dr. Franklin helped Thurgood Marshall's team of lawyers form an argument that the racist history of our country was essential to Jim Crow laws leading to the Brown versus Board of Education decision that began integrating our schools. And throughout his career and with his writings, Dr. Franklin defined the historical background of the Civil Rights Movement, illuminating a path forward toward a brighter future for millions of Americans. He worked personally with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders. He consulted with presidents and received numerous honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom and over a hundred honorary degrees. Durham and the entire state of North Carolina were blessed to become Dr. Franklin's home later in life. Dr. Franklin taught, led, and broke barriers as an academic at Harvard, at the University of Chicago, and at other academic institutions around the world. But we are personally proud of the work that he did right here at St. Augustine's, at North Carolina Central University, and at Duke University here in Durham. His work forging an unbreakable bond between history and advocacy has helped change the fight against racism. Dr. Franklin knew that the wide gap between the promise of American freedom and the reality faced by so many couldn't be bridged by history alone. He knew advocates and policymakers had to use that knowledge of history in the right ways. And he wielded history as a tool to, as he put it, quote, present the case for change in keeping with the express purpose of attaining the promised goals of equality for all people. Dr. Franklin taught us that only through better understanding of the past can we hope to create the change we wish to see today and tomorrow. We can't forget that lesson. And with the divided world that we live in today, these lessons are as valuable and maybe even more valuable than they ever were. Today, we dedicate this highway to Dr. John Hope Franklin to honor the life he led and to remind ourselves and future generations of the value of our whole history, the history of all of us. And as we ride by and we see this road sign, I hope we will pause and think about the history that we ourselves, we ourselves are making right now and that we need to do it right. We must work diligently to learn from our past both the good and the bad, the unsanitized and the unvarnished. And we must turn what we learn into positive actions. Actions that work to assure a North Carolina that as Dr. John Hope Franklin would have wanted, a North Carolina that works for everyone. Thank you very much.
Governor Cooper. Our last speaker for the day, who will be giving our closing remarks, is Dr. Franklin's son, John W. Franklin. John, you please join us today. It's indeed a pleasure for Karen and me to be here today. And I'd like to thank all of those involved in making this possible. But first, I must thank uh, Secretary Fox for helping create another sign in Washington, actually. <laughs> when I first met the Secretary, I said to him, we have hidden history here in Washington, D.C., which was the seat and center of the domestic slave trade. And there's no signage in the city to tell our visitors, our employees, about that history. And you control land, as Secretary of Transportation, where two slave pens sat in Washington, across from the Smithsonian Castle. I gave him the evidence, and then we wrote, designed, fabricated, and had those signs installed right on Independence Avenue, facing the Hershaw, and I thank you for that. The Secretary unveiled those signs as I was speaking across the street for former Attorney General Loretta Lynch on Martin Luther King's holiday, or the observance of his holiday, January 11th. My maternal grandmother, Bertha Kincaid, and her sister, Ethel, first arrived in the I-85 corridor at the turn of the last century as daughters of Bishop A.M.E. Zion Bishop Kincaid when they arrived at Livingston College. Grandpa Samuel W. Whittington, I'm John Whittington, Frank, from Buford, from Beaufort, forgive me. <laughs> was a postal clerk in the railroad and settled in, Green in Goldsboro and married my grandmother. In 1931, my parents met at Fisk, Aurelia from Goldsboro and John Hope from Tulsa. John Hope Franklin first came to Raleigh in 1937 to do research at the State Archives on the Free Negro in North Carolina before the Civil War. But you see, when he arrived there, and some of you have heard this story before, so forgive me. When he arrived at the State Archives from Cambridge, Massachusetts, they said, we're not ready to receive you. They had not had African-American researchers in the State Archives. And they said, can you come back in a week? My father said, no, 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 I'm a graduate student. I have to do my work as soon as possible. So he returned, and my father always said that segregation was adaptive and flexible. <laughs> Three days later, he arrived, and they showed him to his private office with a table, a desk, a chair, a wastebasket, a pencil, a cart and a key to the stacks because they were not going to have white staff fetching materials for an African-American gentleman. So he was very happy. <laughs> he took his cart, rolled it through the reading room. All the white researchers stopped. They wondered what was happening here. He got to the door to the stacks, put his key in, turned it, rolled his cart in came out a little later with a cart stacked of materials that he needed to do his research. When he returned the next day, of course, the white researchers had requested keys to the stack, <laughs> claiming that my father had unfair advantage. <laughs> so my parents married in Goldsboro in 1940 while Dad was teaching at St. Augustine's, then at North Carolina Central, and my mother was the law library here at North Carolina Central. Dad also left occasionally to teach at Bennett, so he's going up and down what was to become the I-85 corridor. 
living just blocks from here, off of Fayetteville, he wrote From Slavery to Freedom. And Miles Mark Fisher would go to sleep hearing his father typing the Negro Slave Songs book and my father echoing him typing the next sentence of From Slavery to Freedom. I appear on the scene in 1952 while Dad was teaching at Howard and my mother was a librarian at Prince George's, College, Prince George's County. When we would leave Washington, D.C. for Goldsboro, I knew that when I saw the statue of Iwo Jima, it meant no more bathrooms, no more restaurants, until we got to our friend Bob and Ella Clark's home at Virginia State in Petersburg. At the North Carolina border, a sign said, the Ku Klux Klan welcomes you to North Carolina. Now, this is when we were going on Highway 301. 301 was stop and go traffic with stop lights, stop lights. So I want you to understand that coming here was a slow process. There were no interstates. Then we would stop in Petersburg and see the Clarks. The next stop would be to see Miss Alice Jones for the next restroom break in Raleigh, and then to 306 James Street in Goldsboro. It was a real relief when Highway 70 was built, and when the interstate system, you know about the problems from the interstate system, I won't dwell on those. But when I-40 and I-85 were built, it made travel so much easier for all of us even though it changed the landscape of North Carolina. Now, my parents moved to Chicago, moved to New York, Chicago, and then the winter of Chicago, the winters of Chicago was scared them right back to North Carolina. <laughs> and when my parents moved the orchids, moved my grandmother here back to Durham, my father remembered a story, a conversation he had with a professor when he was teaching here in the 40s. He was in one of the libraries and ran into a white professor who said to Dad, I understand you're against segregation. My father said, oh, most definitely. My father was then told, he said, well, if segregation ends, you'll be out of a job because the colored schools will close. My father said, quite to the contrary, when segregation ends, your job will be up for grabs. <laughs> So he accepted Duke's offer to teach in the history department and later in the law school. And he and my mother loved being here, loved Durham, loved the institutions and the city. And I thank you all for honoring him today.
It states, whereas Dr. John Hope Franklin was born on January 2nd, 1915 to attorney Bruce Charles Colbert Franklin and Molly Parker Franklin in Oklahoma, and whereas Dr. Franklin graduated from Brooker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then from Frisk University, a historically black university in Nashville, Tennessee in 1955. Dr. Franklin earned a master's degree in 1936 and a doctorate in history in 1941 from Harvard University. And whereas Dr. Franklin's career includes working alongside Thurgood Marshall and the North Carolina, I'm sorry, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that led to the United States Supreme Court ruling in 1954 that the legal separation of black and white children in public schools were unconstitutional, leading to integration of schools. And whereas Dr. Franklin's teaching career began at Fisk University, and he went on to teach at St. Augustine's College, the North Carolina College for Negroes, now North Carolina Central University, Howard University, Brooklyn College, University of Chicago, and the University of Cambridge. And whereas Dr. Franklin was appointed as the James B. Duke Professor of History at Duke University in 1983. In 1985, he took status from his position. During that same time, he helped to establish the Durham Literacy Center and served on its board until 2009. Dr. Franklin was also a professor of legal history at Duke University's law school from 1985 to 1992. And whereas Dr. Franklin was a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, the Organization of American Historians, the, the American Historical Association, and the Southern Historical Association. And whereas the John Hope Franklin Research Center for African and African American History and Culture resides at Duke University. This is also a part of their manuscript library and contains his personal and professional papers. The other academic unit named after Dr. Franklin at Duke University are the John Hope Franklin Center for International Studies and the Franklin Humanities Institute. And whereas Dr. Franklin was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor, and the Order of the Longleaf Pine, the state's highest honor awarded to persons for his exemplary service to the state of North Carolina and the local community. And whereas former United States Secretary Anthony R. Fox requested that this designation of the darn Dr. John Hope Franklin Highway, and whereas the city of the Durham City Council requested to designate a portion of Interstate 85 from Cole Mill Road to US 70 bypass as the Dr. John Hope Franklin Highway. Now therefore be it resolved that the North Carolina Board of Transportation names a portion of Interstate 85 from Cole Mill Road to US 70 bypass as the John H. Franklin Highway. This appropriate signs will be erected at a suitable time. Well, not so suitable because we're about to actually do that. Is Joey Hopkins here? So Joey is our uh, division engineer, by the way, and he's going to um, help us with that. So, um, Joey, I need your help. <laughs> so with that being said, will Dr. Franklin's family, Governor Cooper, Mayor Bill Bell, and all of our guest speakers Join me as we unveil the sign. Speed up! 
in the ghetto. So please go slowly, go safely on this portion of Highway 85 going through Durham County. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Deputy Howard. He has indicated to us that the, the sign will be much bigger than this one. Much bigger. <laughs> we hope so. Thank you. <laughs> With that, if I could please have Reverend Mark Anthony Middleton, please come and give us our benediction. And then again, thank you so much. And with that, we're going to have uh, Reverend Thank you. If you're able and it's not a hardship, would you please stand? Let us pray. We go now, O oh Lord, inspired by the life and legacy of John Hope Franklin. And as we travel up and down this highway, named for him, this beloved son, may we be reminded that as we come, we all have a history. But as we go, may we be reminded that we need not be constrained by it. Let us go and do like our son did. Live, learn, and share. Amen. Amen.